Welcome everybody to today's webinar on taking health back from corporations, pandemics, big pharma and privatized health. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, in particular in this Earth Day, where several justice, justice movements uh, are mobilizing. I'm Monica Vargas from the Transnational Institute and I work with the Corporate Power Project. And uh, today's web webinar is being live interpreted into French and Spanish. So you should see the button interpretation in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can choose there your language. Este seminario será interpretado hacia el castellano, o sea que pueden acceder a la interpretación en el botón que se encuentra en, la, en el menú de, de Zoom de abajo. Ce séminaire sera traduit vers le français, donc vous pouvez activer l'option d'interprétation pour avoir accès à la, à la version française dans le menu du Zoom qui se trouve en bas de votre écran. So, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, the interpreters that are organizing this and making it possible for more than 1,000 people to participate today in the webinar. Uh, this webinar will bring um, together healthcare experts with activists at the forefront of struggles for equitable universal public healthcare from across the globe. And it will examine the changes that will be needed in terms of access to medicines, the pharmaceutical industry, the, and the global governance of health. Uh, it has been organized by the Transnational Institute, TNI, the Alternative Information Development Center from South Africa, Focus on the Global South from Asia, the People's Health Movement, Public Services International, the Geneva Global Health Hub, the Red Latin Americana de Acceso a los Medicamentos, the Brazilian AIDS Interdisciplinary Association, Rebrief, the Working Group on Intellectual Property, Corporate Accountability International, and Global Justice Now. So we have a full range of co-sponsors. Thanks a lot for that. We will be joined by five speakers, Susan George, Baba A, Mark Haywood, Kajal Badwaj, and David Lake. And first of all, at the start of this webinar, we'd like to pause just a little bit to dedicate our thoughts, our very special thoughts, to all the people that are suffering globally from this cruel pandemic, and especially to those who have died and to their loved ones. And at the same time, of course, we salute in solidarity the affected communities, the movements, the unions, who despite the pain, still stand and confront corporate power. TNI is an international activist think tank uh, that is committed to connect progressive intellectuals and movements for transformative change and social justice. And to that end, we regularly publish new research and organize events to develop collective analysis of the political moment. You know? So precisely at this moment, a main effort of our work is taking the form of a series of weekly webinars, which take place every Wednesday and address different dimensions of the current crisis. You can subscribe to our newsletter for updates and in case you have missed any of our past webinars, uh, you can consult them at the YouTube channel of TNI. No. So for the format of today, we will start by an introduction thanks to Susan George and then the other four panelists will intervene. We will then move to some questions from the floor, which will give each panelist to a chance to respond to. So you can share your questions during the session via the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. And during the session, we'll be also sharing links and resources that are useful uh, on the issues around the webinar in the chat box. You can also engage there with other participants, but uh, ju just if you have questions, please register them in the, in the Q&A box. And uh, finally, if you are on Twitter or social media, you can use the hashtag slash TNI webinars and so you, you really feel free to, to share your thoughts and reflections with us there as well. I'm going to, to introduce uh, Susan George. So first of all, Susan is TN9's president and one of TNI's most renewed people for her long-term and groundbreaking analysis of global issues. Shadow Sovereigns, How Global Corporations Are Sizing Power is the latest of her 17 widely translated books. She describes her work in a cogent way that, what, that has become to define actually TNI. She says that the job of the responsible social scientist is first to uncover these forces of wealth, power, and control, to write about them clearly without jargon, and finally to take an advocacy position 
in favor of the disadvantaged and the victims of injustice. So thank you very much for joining us, Susan. From, she's joining us from Paris. Welcome. The floor is yours, Susan. In five minutes, and if I cough, don't be alarmed. It's not the horrible disease that so many unfortunate people are getting. It's simply sinus, and so don't don't worry. Um, first point, I'd like to give an idea of how strong are these lobbies. How, what are they working with and for? First of all, I added up ten top companies, the ten biggest pharmaceutical companies in the, in, in the world, and they come to a total sum in capital of 1.8 trillion dollars. What is a trillion? A trillion, if you look at your watch, count the seconds, every second is one dollar. That means that you're going to have to look at your watch for 32 hours to get to 1 trillion. This is a lot of money. And the, these companies, the top 10, have a total of 58,000 years. So that gives you perhaps an idea. The health industry is the biggest uh, lobbyist in the United States, and I'm giving you things from the United States because that's a basis for understanding lobbies everywhere. The health industry is not just pharmaceuticals, it's various chains of profit-making hospitals, profit-making clinics, profit-making nursing homes, etc. So health uh, is going to be at the center of, of the financial lobbying of the world. And for other people in other countries, if you understand the American system, you will understand what lobbies want, what they are after. They are after getting a hold of regulatory co cooperation. They don't want to govern everything, but they do want to make the rules. And they want the rules to be the same as those in the United States, which means that if there are a lot of, of people complaining about any drug, for example, they will have to prove that that drug is harming them. They will have to have a long period of trying, of even, of, <coughs> sorry, even of examining with other people and making a lawsuit against the company because they cannot, they cannot uh, otherwise have a, a, make a dent in the lobby. The United States is the contrary of what we want as individuals. We want the precautionary principle, which is a system for saying if we if we let it go on to the market now we may make a very big mistake and so we will not put it on the market we will wait until we have absolute proof this is the opposite of the way the united states does it they want also to have insurance be the be all and end all of the lobbying system the United States, Britain, and others, some pay out of just ordinary taxes, the National Health Service in Britain, for instance, but the United States is about insurance, private insurance, and there again, there's a lot of money to be made. Health is about money, it is not about curing people. The US system does not treat everyone. There are people who go without health, care at all because they can't afford it. In Brussels, there are probably about 30,000 lobbyists. Corporate Europe Observatory can give you all of the data on every kind of lobbying in the European Union. Probably 30,000 in Brussels, probably almost the same amount, but less 
in the United States because in the United States, they have to sign in, but in Brussels, there, there can be any number of lobbyists who are not signing in and, and saying what they are doing. The lobbies are, lobbies want lower taxes for the rich, deregulation in everything, privatization, they are hand in hand with the liberal market system and they say everything should be just in time. So you don't have reserves for this epidemic. You don't have reserves of masks, of blouses, of ventilators. No, you just go in with just enough because this system of lobbying is totally tied up with the, the neoliberal economic system. So if you know what neo neoliberalism, what I just cited, lower taxes for the rich deregulation, privatization, and liberalization because the market will fix it, that is the blueprint that lobbyists want for the entire health system of the world. So you can see that this is not aimed at helping people. It's not aimed at, it's aimed only at profits and for that we are in a, we're smaller we're not as rich but we have ethics on our side and we have i think also the sympathy of most of the people in the world who certainly do not want to be sick and certainly do not want to be victims of pandemics of this kind we're not ready for this pandemic because we have allowed our health systems to become neoliberalized. And that is why we cannot attack in the way that it should have been attacked from the beginning. China did a reasonably good job. Europe is doing a very bad one because it is a neoliberal situation. And the United States is probably worst of all. I think that's my time limit. Um, can can Monica tell me if that's my time limit? Yes, that's that's that will be fine, Susan. Okay. Um, the the only thing that I also want to say is that if we have, uh, I, I want to, to cite the the um, the president Franklin Roosevelt. He said. In 1936, we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. And that is the truth. That is what neoliberalism is. It's a mob, a minority, and they are governing like an organized mob. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Susan, for this very helpful introduction. Um, we will go now to Baba A, give the word to Baba A. Baba is Health Officer at Public Services International and Deputy President of the Geneva Global Health Hub. He worked for two decades with the Medical and Health Workers Union of Nigeria, becoming Deputy Secretary General. Baba, welcome, thank a lot for joining us from Geneva, Switzerland. We would like to ask you to explain how, in the moment of COVID-19, the sustained global privatization attack on the public health system left it hollowed out in both the North and the South with tremendous impact on people's lives, including significant loss of life of health workers. How did we reach this point? What are the reasons behind our loss of the right to health? What is the role of the big health corporations in this? And finally, what are the challenges and strategies being developed by trade unions and the health workers going forward? Thanks, Baba, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, Monica. I would say that to understand uh, the making of this heist and why we are where we are today, uh, with uh, health workers being ill-equipped uh, to 
fight and uh, health uh, been uh, put in jeopardy for millions, we have to go back to 1978 and specifically to the International uh, Conference on Primary Health Care organized by the WHO and UNICEF. Uh, looking back now, it's um, like uh, a message uh, in a bottle. Uh, at a point, the ship was about to face uh, a shipwreck uh, uh, for our generation to pick now. That conference um, proclaimed for health for all by the year 2000. Uh, and it made it clear that that um, needed uh, the establishment uh, of uh, a new international economic order. It was trying to capture and build on something that was slipping away. Uh, and that was uh, the spirit of uh, what led to the emergence of the World Health Organization. 30 years back, uh, and which uh, Ken Loach, um, the uh, British film writer, described as the spirit of 48. This was putting, you know, public health at the center of healthcare delivery. But subsequently to Alma Ata conference, you had the uh, corporatization and marketization of health. This um, started um, in the 80s with uh, in uh, countries like uh, Britain, uh, private finance uh, initiatives, uh, and uh, in um, third world countries, as we were called then, um, and specifically in Africa, uh, after the uh, World Bank uh, Beg Report of 1981, introduction of user fees. The argument uh, essentially uh, centered around that uh, there was not enough money uh, for the public uh, system to deliver healthcare. So we had to get uh, corporations involved, we had to get people pay user fees, and then the uh, argument also of efficiency. Uh, but as uh, things have uh, shown with a lot of studies, um, this has really not been the case. Essentially, uh, such PFIs and uh, public-private partnerships as they are now considered to be amount to uh, subsidizing uh, private interest and pockets uh, with uh, money from uh, the public till that could have uh, been used to uh, provide uh, universal public uh, health care. And um, which you can see, like the big report I gave an example of, and in other ways, including with conditionalities, you have the international financial institutions also playing a role uh, 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 in this. But now to the corporate bodies themselves, you would say an unholy trinity emerged, uh, an unholy trinity of uh, the, the big pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, the uh, global health companies, and uh, private health finance, because uh, part of what happened with the changing of the world um, subsequent to 1978 uh, was uh, also uh, the emergence of um, such supposedly innovative means uh, of, of, of financing health. But uh, what we see is that um, these uh, companies have been more interested in making money. And uh, to, to put it in perspective, the, it is estimated that the health sector is uh, uh, worth some 5.8 trillion uh, US uh, dollars annually. Uh, and um, uh, Susan gave an uh, idea of over a trillion worth of uh, the, the, the big farmers. And you know, with big money also goes uh, big influence internationally uh, and on governments and also in other indirect ways which help to entrench uh, the, the, the powers, influence, and control of corporate, of corporate bodies uh, on healthcare delivery. I mean, some 15 years back, for example, the British Medical Journal um, drew uh, attention to the fact that more than half of postgraduate uh, medical um, programs, uh, people pursuing medical programs in the in the UK were being funded by uh, by big pharma, uh, and uh, that you have um, uh, persons in authority been invited to speak at uh, these pharmaceuticals uh, conferences and uh, getting as much as some 
5,000 pounds for speaking for one hour. And uh, th these things um, have ways of influencing decisions they make. And uh, it is not only that this money is uh, skimmed from uh, the public till uh, using uh, several mechanisms to legitimize them, including uh, free trade, I mean, which actually is brigandage. Uh, uh, it, it still doesn't end at that. Uh, most of uh, these corporate bodies are also uh, involved uh, in, in, in tax avoidance. Uh, um, the PSI in collaboration with uh, uh, Center for uh, Corporate and Tax Accountability researchers has shown that uh, most of these uh, big uh, uh, corporations uh, have uh, loads of money in the 36 trillion uh, dollars that is in tax havens uh, across the world. Uh, and um, I'll give some quick examples with regards to also how uh, they uh, managed to uh, to, to try and make malleable, you know, um, decision and lawmaking processes. Uh, for example, um, a year there about back in California, you, you had a referendum which was uh, um, to limit the amount of profit of, uh, that was made on dialysis procedures uh, to not more than 115% of uh, total uh, cost that um, such uh, companies, uh, uh, the costs of, of including, of course, um, payment of wages and so on and so forth, medical supplies and all that. And the uh, dialysis, the global health companies involved, uh, which Fresenius are the head of these, uh, they raised uh, over 130 uh, US dollars uh, for a campaign to stop that uh, as against uh, uh, barely 18, 18 million dollars that um, the trade unions and civil society organizations used. I mean, not surprisingly, uh, it won with 59% uh, of, 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 of the votes. Uh, and um, these um, corporate bodies also, you see them, uh, the, the work practices in their workplaces are, are also nothing to write, write, write home about. Uh, now, for, for us as, as trade unions, and I, I want to talk specifically on, on vaccines uh, whilst we're uh, at this as uh, within, within the big pharma. In uh, 2016, drawing from uh, the experience of uh, the Ebola outbreak, uh, the coalition um, um, for C CPI, you know, Coalition for Epidemic uh, Prepare Preparedness Innovations was established, um, I mean, corporations and government. Not surprisingly, it was announced in Davos uh, in 20, 2017. And uh, about uh, a billion of it, uh, a, a billion dollars it, it, it uh, wanted to start with uh, had been uh, uh, raised when uh, some two years back, uh, uh, Medicine Song from Frontier um, pointed out that, I mean, uh, such an effort should uh, uh, put uh, intellectual property rights in abeyance uh, for um, vaccines to, to be available to a wide scope of uh, uh, persons. But companies like Johnson & Johnson, like Tedeka, the Japanese uh, pharmacy, they stood against this and CEPI, -C I mean, uh, bent to, to, to them. Uh, now, uh, you relate this with um, what the interest of uh, uh, the big farmers involved in vaccine is. Uh, in, in 2016, the profit they were making annually uh, from vaccines was uh, some 25 billion US dollars. And uh, the, it was projected by that by this year that would rise to 61 uh, billion dollars. And, and that arguably is, is part of what informed they have been uh, involved in, in CPI. Uh, however, and, and this is part of how uh, monies, public monies is used to subsidize our private interest. It's, it's that uh, over 900 billion US dollars have been spent by governments, you know, uh, uh, since the 1930s till uh, recently uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, helping to develop uh, pharmaceutical products which uh, are then patented and, and, uh, and, and made money is made from this, from this big farmers. 
No, you see, it is uh, not enough for us to interpret what is happening, but uh, to uh, adequately fight against this and change. This we are at a moment where uh, we can and must fight to change. The Public Services International uh, has been organizing uh, a right to health campaign for the past four years, uh, in which we place the arguments forward and in which our affiliates in 154 countries have uh, been arguing with their governments and uh, organizing uh, civil society support as well to demand uh, universal public uh, health care. I mean, right to health for our uh, is, is is not something that will be given to us uh, without our fighting for, for, for this. And uh, at this point in time that governments have been uh, forced to go back on uh, what even after Thatcher still remained implicit that there's no alternative uh, to neoliberalism. They were forced to requisition hospitals, to requisition factories and convert this to make problem to make a personal private and protective equipment and medical supplies, we must insist that no going back, our health is not for sale. Uh, uh, and at this point in time, I want to say that that is the most important uh, thing now, not only for us to understand what is happening, but us to be decided in saying, no going back, never again, we're going to defend you know, what had been before 1978 and that was rolled back uh, and uh, build a better world based on uh, universal public health, the right to health for everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Baba, for this very important contribution. Um, next, we will hear from Mark Haywood. Mark is joining us from South Africa. He's also a South African human rights um, a journalist, give me one second, I lost my camera. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry about this. Yeah. Um, so he's, yeah. Mark is a, a human rights and social justice activist based in Johannesburg. And between 1997 and uh, 2010, he was the, the head of the AIDS Law Project, ALP. And later he co-founded uh, Section 27. He was also one of the founders of the Treatment Action Campaign, the AIDS and Rights Alliance of Southern Africa, Corruption Watch, and Save South Africa. And he's now div dividing his time between a position as the founding co-editor of a new civil society social justice segment of the South Africa's most widely read online news source, that's the Daily Maverick, and he's also doing research. Mark, so welcome and thanks a lot for joining us. Mark, we, we have seen that the global intellectual property rights regime grossly limited the access to medicines, which you in South Africa faced head on on the pandemic uh, on AIDS. No? How is that now playing out in the COVID-19 pandemic? What are the actual impacts on people's health and how is Big Pharma profiting from that? What is your experience uh, and on, on the and the strategies? So, and if you can bring more points on how to counter the power of the farmers, and what are the initiatives being pu pushed by people's campaigns on the ground? So, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica, and uh, good afternoon or good day, uh, comrades all over the world. Uh, it's great to speak to you uh, from Johannesburg. Um, Baba started his input by taking us back to 1978 and the Alma-Ata Declaration. I want to start my input by taking us back to 1994, which was the year when in South Africa uh, we got liberation, we won liberation after 350 years of racism and of colonialism and of apartheid. And when we won liberation, one of the first areas we wanted to address was inequality in health, uh, because health was a marker of discrimination. And in the question of inequality in health, there was the question of inequality in access to life-saving and disease-preventing uh, medicines. But unfortunately, almost at the same moment that we got our freedom, our political freedom, the uh, United States and other developed countries and pharmaceutical companies 
were plotting uh, to chain us up again uh, through creating the World Trade Organization uh, in January 1995, and then through, in particular, uh, an agreement I think we all know about called the TRIPS Agreement, uh, the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property, which extended very high standards of intellectual property uh, all around the world and was intended to strangle and to strengthen the hold of the research and uh, brand pharmaceutical companies. Now, as activists and as freedom fighters, we didn't know about this thing called TRIPS. We didn't know about this thing called WTO uh, to begin with. Uh, I think we'd been a little bit sleeping or fighting other struggles when that uh, happened, but it made itself felt for us when our government uh, attempted to amend legislation to allow medicines, to make medicines more affordable, but also at the moment when the AIDS epidemic in South Africa began to lead to uh, uh, many people getting sick and to many people uh, uh, dying. When our government attempted to amend that legislation, 39 pharmaceutical companies took the government to court. When we tried to uh, get access to AIDS medicines, we found that AIDS medicines were literally affordable to only perhaps one or two or three people, the richest people in South Africa, that poor people who lived with HIV were going to die because of AIDS. And in fact, in the last 20 years, three million people in our country have died because of AIDS, many of them because the medicines were unaffordable. But one of the messages that I want to get across in this discussion is that in spite of what Baba said about the resources, the money, the lobbying that these companies command, people are more powerful when we get organized and pharmaceutical companies are not invincible and we have to understand that. In 1999, we started and literally with 10 people an organization called the Treatment Action Campaign to fight over this question of the price of medicines. And there isn't time to go into the, the, uh, the detail of that struggle. But what I do want to say is that, because this is relevant to all of us, it was that it was a combination of social mobilization on the ground of poor and working class people who needed access to medicines, together with asserting that health is a right for all people around the world and using the law and the constitution where it was possible to do that, together with the use of media and making the question of pharmaceutical companies causing death a moral question, even for those people who can afford access to, 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 to medicines. I also want to say that although for a few years the front line of that struggle was South Africa, it was always a global struggle. That we fought it with activists in Brazil, with activists in India, including Kajal, who will speak in, in a few minutes, uh, 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 and with many other activists in many other countries in the world. And I think that for three or four years in the late 1990s and through to the early 2000s, we showed that organized people were more powerful than the pharmaceutical companies. And we were able to force the WTO to reach an agreement called the Doha Declaration. And this Doha Declaration on intellectual property and health is very, very important again in the context of COVID-19, which accepted that states, governments could issue compulsory licenses where there were public health emergencies that required access to medicines, to life-saving medicines. Now, of course, that's not enough for us. We don't only want the right of access to medicines in instances where there's an emergency. All medicines must be affordable, and we don't want to have to fight for every single essential medicine as part of the right of access to healthcare services. But nonetheless, it was an important victory. There were other important victories across Africa. We forced, together with India, certain voluntary licenses which brought down the price of medicines and it was a struggle of activists around HIV 
that has changed the trajectory of the AIDS epidemic and has ultimately saved millions of, of lives. But comrades, what I want to say is that, that in the middle of the 2000s, I believe we as activists took our eyes off the ball, all of us. From fighting globally in a coordinated way, we fell back. India had to have its fight. South Africa had to have its fight. Brazil had to have its fight. We moved on to other issues. And pharmaceutical companies were then able to regroup, reorganize themselves. They realized that they were vulnerable. They realized that they were being watched closely. And I think that in the years probably from 2006, 2007, although we may have had a victory here and there, uh, that they have once again uh, managed to, to, to reassert their power. So the situation that we face today is that whilst HIV drugs and medicines are very affordable in developing countries, not in developed countries, uh, in South Africa, people die of cancer because they can't afford uh, medicines. In many other countries, people die of cancer and many other preventable causes of illnesses. People continue to die because diagnostics are too expensive, because they are, 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 are patented. So, so, so I believe, unfortunately, and of course we can, we, we, we can uh, uh, debate this, that we have found ourselves uh, back in much the same situation that we found ourselves in in the late 1990s, uh, and that it is time to regroup and to rebuild uh, our arguments around uh, the critical importance of, of access to medicines. And that is uh, uh, one other thing before I, I'll conclude, is that we have to reassert in the context of attacks on the world's uh, uh, health organization, the fact that health is a, a, a human right, that many of our countries have ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and that if health is in our constitutions, if it is in our laws, that it must mean something and that it must create a duty on governments to act against profiteering and private interests when they impede the right of access to, to healthcare systems and to recognize that you cannot talk about universal healthcare systems, you cannot talk about universal quality private healthcare if you can't in the same breath uh, guarantee people the fruits of science, of medical development, of medical understanding and of, uh, and, and, and of, and of modern uh, technologies. So I want to, to, to finish by just bringing us uh, to the crisis that we are, are, are in uh, today. Um, you know, in our country, uh, we're just at the beginning of the, the COVID-19, the national COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, uh, the number of infections, the number of deaths is still relatively low. But we are fearful that because health has not been treated as a right, even though it is in our constitution, because we have high levels of non-communicable diseases, where people and the government is unable to access the medicines, unable to access the medical technologies, the infrastructure, that COVID-19 in Africa and across Africa and across the developing world could wreak much greater havoc and death and misery than has been the case and as we are seeing in Europe and the United States at this moment in time. And we're fighting as hard as we can to prevent that. At this stage, our struggle is to use the tools that we have to prevent infection, to prevent community transmission, to ready our healthcare systems. But there will come a point because there will be a vaccine for COVID-19 and there will be therapies for COVID-19. There will come a point where these questions of access and affordability and patents around those are the defining questions. Of this, uh, of, of this epidemic. And what we cannot afford to do is wait until the vaccine is developed to start raising questions about access and about affordability and about patents. We have to put that question 
very much on the agenda by demanding now that there is universal access, not just to the vaccine when it's developed, but to the knowledge, to the understanding, as that knowledge and understanding is developed, and that there should be no private profiteering of this medicine, because of this vaccine, because as with the HIV drugs, as with the cancer drugs, as with almost all medicines, it is through generally through public investment and public research that we get these breakthroughs, which are then taken over for private benefit and for private, uh, pr private profiteering. So COVID-19 presents us with a disaster. It's killing our comrades, it's killing our friends, it's hurting our countries, it's threatening human rights. But we must also see it, as Baba said, the point at which we say health is not for sale, that there is no going back, that we are going to reassert that once we overcome this crisis, this immediate crisis, health will be run as a right across the globe and not for private profit and for private benefit. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark, for this very important contribution. We'll come back to several of your points as well as the others at the end. Um, so our next guest will be Kajal Badwaj. She's joining us from India. Kajal is a lawyer based in Delhi, and she has played a key role in the access to medicines movement worldwide. For the past two decades, she has been working on issues related to trade, health, and rights, and a key area of her work has been on intellectual property and access to medicines. So Kajal, welcome. Thanks a lot for joining us today. So Kajal, still staying uh, with the impacts of the intellectual property rights regime on health, we would like to ask you about the different dimensions it covers and how that is shown in the COVID-19 crisis. What are the concrete cases that show how this is impacting in the struggle against the pandemic? How are our governments and the people's movements dealing with those limits imposed by the intellectual property rights regime? And are there effective initiatives and cases we can learn from? The floor is yours, Kajal. Thanks a lot. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Monica, um, and uh, for a very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, TNI, PHM, and the other sponsors for putting together this important webinar, uh, not just for the topic, but for, you know, uh, for the opportunity to iron some clothes and put on some formal wear uh, in these times of staying home. Uh, I'll take off from where Mark uh, actually left. Uh, and, you know, as Mark has so eloquently explained, the last time uh, there was such uh, global attention focused on corporate power and monopolies uh, was almost exactly two decades ago uh, when the cruel implications of patents on HIV treatment uh, literally drew a line in the sand between life and death uh, between the North and the South. Uh, we see that global attention once more uh, acutely focused on intellectual property rights that in most of our countries are enforced now through international trade rules, as Mark uh, explained. But unlike 20 years ago, we now have a massive expansion of these regimes in our own national and regional legal systems. Uh, and we see just how deeply entrenched these intellectual property protections are across all aspects uh, of, of health products that we might need for COVID-19, whether it's preventive gear, whether it's diagnosis, whether it's medicines, or whether it's va uh, vaccines. Um, could I get the first slide? I have a few slides just to help with this uh, discussion. So um, I think over here, what you see is just some of the cases that maybe some of you have already actually even heard of or are keeping track of. Uh, on the left-hand side, on the top, uh, you look at the, the sort of masks that, that we need for healthcare workers. And 3M, the US company manufacturing these masks, uh, is amongst the top 100 patent filers. They have aggressively enforced their patent, uh, patents on masks, including in my country in India. Uh, and we've already seen one US state asking 3M to give up their patents so that other manufacturers could actually step in. Uh, below the masks, you see a diagnostic machine that many of you working on TB would be familiar with. Uh, it's available and installed in many developing countries. It gives test results in 45 minutes. So wouldn't it be great that it, they can actually test for COVID-19 as well? except the company Cephid has actually priced the, their cartridges for COVID-19 at $20 per cartridge, whereas health groups estimate that even with a profit, this could be priced at $5. And on the right-hand side is, I'm sure, something that, that many of you must have come across news of, 
uh, when Italy, particularly at the, at the height, and, and of course they're continuing still to struggle with the, with the outbreak, there were many 3D printing enthusiasts who were actually printing parts of ventilators that their hospitals required. And as soon as they did that, the companies that held patents on these uh, threatened with them with legal actions. So we're already seeing what the impact of intellectual property would be across many of these dimensions that will affect uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. Next. Right, so don't get alarmed at this, uh, this picture. It's just something that I thought would uh, help us understand what is happening a little bit with potential treatments for COVID-19, uh, just to see what potential drug tra targets are being looked at. So if you look at, uh, you know, just to be clear, this is a, a, a very small idea of the medicines. There are 145 studies and over 30 potential treatments. So if you look at the left-hand side, uh, you see where the COVID-19 virus is entering the cell and you see a bunch of treatments that, are, that we hope will stop viral entry. This includes drugs like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, the two malaria drugs that you may have heard of a lot, which got an alarming and controversial push in the US even before we have evidence of whether they work or not. At the bottom where you see the virus has actually entered the cell, you see a host of treatments that people living with HIV or with hepatitis C are familiar with. These are meant to prevent the virus from replicating in the cell. This includes treatments like lupinavir, ritonavir, which is currently used in HIV, and remdesivir, which is originally tried but failed to be used uh, for Ebola. And then once the virus exits on the right-hand side, you see a little box over there with some biologic medicines, which the hope is that they would actually stop the, the overreaction of the immune system that is actually leading to many deaths. So this is just to give you an idea of what the potential drug targets are. Um, we don't know as of now which of these treatments will work. We don't know if they will require other treatments. We don't know at what severity of the disease they could work. But we do know some things. For one, we know that these are drugs that are already existing and they're old medicines. So what we're trying is repurposing. You're taking an existing medicine and seeing if it can work for a new illness. We also know that the companies involved in many of these medicines have heavily patented these medicines. Many have expired patents, but that's not going to stop these companies from applying for new intellectual property protection on it. Next. I just did a quick snapshot of the patents and patent applications on remdesivir and tocilizumab, the biologic drug in China. And what you see here is multiple patents and patent applications already on these drugs. Uh, and you see on the, in the last column what the expiry dates of these patents are actually going to be. This is what we call evergreening of patents, where multiple patents are filed on the same drug for new forms and new uses uh, to extend the, the amount of exclusivity, the time of exclusivity that companies uh, have over this. So the idea that it's a 20-year patent, after it expires, generic companies will step in, you will have affordable and available treatment available is actually not the way the patent system is used. And this actually shows how the patent system currently is being abused. We also know the tactics that pharma typically fall back on to deflect criticism in terms of access concerns. This includes donations, price cuts, and voluntary licenses. These strategies actually allow pharma to continue to maintain control of these medicines because they decide who gets the drugs, when they get them, how they get them, and usually at what cost they get them. So there have been a mix of strategies announced by pharma so far. Uh, Swiss multinational company Novartis has announced uh, trials for hydroxychloroquine to see if it works for COVID-19. And then they announced that they would license their intellectual property on this. This was quite a baffling announcement for many of us because the drug dates back to the 1950s. So maybe they plan to apply for new intellectual property on this, and this is quite an alarming uh, situation to look at. For remdesivir, which uh, there's been a lot of excitement in the media recently, the company concerned is uh, the US multinational Gilead. They have not announced what their plans are on intellectual property. They are saying they're mapping access op options, they are ramping up manufacturing, and they hope to have a million treatment courses ready by December of 2020. Um, just for a little perspective on Gilead, uh, five years ago, they introduced the now infamous $1,000 a pill drug for treating hepatitis C uh, called sofosbuvir. And Gilead's games on access for this drug meant that five years into its introduction, most people in the developing world who needed access to this medicine did not have it. And Gilead's profits in the meantime had gone in excess of $58 billion just from this drug alone. Now, given the scale of the pandemic, the pressure that COVID-19 has created, there are many writers out there who say that pharma will simply not behave the way they have in the last 10 or 15 years when we're faced with an emergency like this. Maybe, but I think we would be fools not to learn from history. 
One of the interesting developments that has also happened is Abvi, which is a company that uh, controls uh, the patents on lupinavir, ritonavir for HIV treatment, announcing that they would no longer enforce patents on it. Uh, what the headlines missed, of course, was that before this announcement, uh, the government of Israel had already issued a compulsory license for this dairy medicine. So this is the other thing that we know, that when there is government action or a credible threat of government action, you can get good behavior from companies. And apart from Israel, we have seen really positive developments coming out from the governments of Germany, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, who have put in places uh, who have already put in place measures for issuing compulsory licenses or are asking the ministries of health to do so. Uh, one of the most more interesting proposals is a bill that Brazil is, uh, the Brazilian parliament is considering, uh, which would warrant the granting of compulsory licensing on any products or technologies needed automatically when there is an international emergency that is declared. Uh, and this is quite an exciting prospect because it takes away a lot of the procedural difficulties that we face within the current international system to issue compulsory licenses. Um, we also know uh, that there is significant generic production capacity in many of our countries. Some of it is concentrated in China, in India. There is public production capacity in Thailand, in Brazil, in North Africa, in Argentina, in Russia. Uh, for vaccines, the capacity is much more limited, but the reality is that we could actually ramp up production quite quickly, at least of the chemical medicines, if they do get approved. Uh, next slide, please. We also know, thanks to some absolutely stellar work that has been done by public interest-minded academics, and they have really set the cat among the pigeons. Pharma is not happy with this study that has come out, uh, showing up us what the minimum cost of production would be for some of these treatments that are being trialed. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to look at the last column on that slide, and you see that the estimated price or, or the cost of production per day for these treatments is a dollar or less than a dollar. So we know that these treatments can be made at extremely affordable prices. So we know what to expect from the companies. We know that production capacities exist, even if they're limited. We know what the potential prices could be, and we know what go actions governments need to take. So the question for us really is, who is going to bell the cat? Uh, next slide, and the one after that, please. Just skip this one, the next one. Thanks. So I'll come back to where Mark uh, actually left off, and I'll end with highlighting some of the important work and initiatives that are being taken by people's movements and civil society groups to ensure that intellectual property barriers do not make what is already potentially a devastating pandemic even worse. Several groups are focused on a proposal by Costa Rica to the World Health Organization to set up a voluntary pool for all technologies and products and all their associated intellectual property so that any country can license it. There is an open COVID pledge that many technology companies that may be instrumental in bringing medical equipment have shown some interest in, but some health groups are getting back just to the hard legal work that has been done for the last 10 or 15 years. In India, a cancer group has filed for a revocation of the patents granted to Gilead. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, my ap apologies to the interpreter, I'll just slow down, uh, though it's my last point. Um, have filed a request to the government to revoke the patents on, on remdesivir, uh, showing that these were patents that simply should not have been granted in the first place. Uh, while other, other groups are working with their countries to issue compulsory licenses or put into place laws that would allow this to happen. Next. And I'll wrap up with this uh, saying that this work by people's movements, by health groups, by civil society organizations, is in fact the last but the most important piece of the puzzle to ensure access. It's very difficult to cloud or shake the institutional memories of people's movements or fighting corporate control over health. Uh, people's histories are carried across generations, across countries, and they're written in blood and stone. And I think that is where our collective battles for access will be won, whether it is for this pandemic or indeed for the everyday pandemics that we see in the struggle for health. So I'll end with all power to the people. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kajala, for your super important intervention. So finally, we will go to David Lake. Uh, David is a retired public health academic based in Melbourne, Australia. So first of all, thanks a lot, David, for joining. It's past midnight uh, at your home, so thanks again. So David has undertaken research and teaching in the political economy of health, comparative health systems, primary health care, and global health policy. And he has also been closely involved with the People's Health Movement since its formation in December 2000. 
He's particularly involved with the International People's Health University, a short course in the political economy of health and in the World Health Organization Watch Project. So David, welcome again. David, in a scenario of a global pandemic such as COVID-19, we all wonder why the answers to it have been so fragmented, so isolated and national. So then what is the role of the World Health Organization in the governance of global health? Why does it look so weak and not prepared to deal with the emergency? What's the role played by big health corporations and related private sector philanthropic foundations in this? Is this pandemic a call for a new public uh, global contract for health in the world? And does this relate to the roles of people's movement campaigning for a more democratic global governance robust in the protection of people's rights and free of corporate capture? David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monica. It's uh, really great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I say hello to the lots and lots of people who are participating, including some very dear friends. Um, what I want to cover briefly is th four main points. One is um, to talk about WHO itself and what I call the donor chokehold, the way in which the donor dependence of WHO has been used to promote corporate interests, in particular the interests of pharma. I also want to make a comment on the early response to the COVID crisis of both China and WHO, in particular the issue of the, at the early stage of person-to-person -person transmission. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to reflect a bit on recent pandemics and global preparedness. Uh, and a little bit of a note on trade restrictions and travel restrictions in pandemic control and end up with a little a few thoughts about what is to be done. <clears throat> Firstly about WHO, it's really important to understand that WHO has two sides, the governing bodies and the secretariat. The governing bodies, especially the World Health Assembly, is are where the member states come together to govern the organisation. The Secretariat is the staff of the organisation led by the Director General. The WHO has worked in particularly over the last 30 years under increasing pressure of donor control. WHO now is essentially totally dependent for its program funding on tied voluntary contributions from rich countries, from the World Bank, and from the big philanthropies, especially Gates. So the World Health Assembly, where the countries of the world meet together, adopts a national a notional budget. But what WHO can then do is completely dependent on what the donors are willing to fund. A um, little bit more detail on this one. The, in the late 1980s, there was a freeze placed on assessed contributions required from member state countries. These are the mandatory contributions that the countries are, uh, are required to make um, under the threat of US withdrawal if assessed contributions were increased. This freeze on assessed contributions has been ameliorated in some degree by increased donor funding. But over the period since the 90, late 1980s, the WHO's um, revenues are in, so, uh, now re require or depend on donor funding for 80%, which is essentially all of the program work. So the 20% the which comes from assessed contributions is basically just covers keeping the lights on. Um, the Budget. So what happens here is that the budget priorities are determined by the World Health Assembly, but th what is actually done by WHO is depends on whether the donors will fund it. And the donors um, are quite restrictive in the conditions they place on their funding. It's not just what the donors will fund, it's also the use of the threat to cut donor funding to control the Secretariat's behaviour. 
so there's been a, a no, any number of examples of bullying, in particular by the US, um, of the Secretariat um, to make them come to the, uh, to the party. Um, I want to list a few, four or five particular cases where US bullying and donor control have been used to, um, to advance the interests of Big Pharma. One of the earlier ones was US opposition to WHO adopt, adopting an essential medicines list, li providing advice to countries to say, this is a, a minimal list that you really ought to have and don't be fooled into the marketing of Big Pharma. Pharma hates the essential medicines list and the US was right at the forefront of trying to prevent it. Fortunately, it's now standard. The second one I want to talk about is the code of practice around medicines promotion and action on the rational use of medicines. So the US and the other rich country donors um, used their power in the assembly to prevent the assembly from adopting a, um, a, a binding code on ethical promotion of, of uh, pharma, but um, then used their uh, capacity to refuse donor funding to prevent any action on the rational use of medicines. So pharma's marketing strategies are um, unchallenged uh, in effect. The th third and the more relevant to the presentations from Mark and Kajal is the use of bullying, again, to prevent WHO from giving advice to countries about how they pass into law the principles of the TRIPS agreement and the, how they um, accept some of the propositions being put to them about intellectual property in the uh, uh, free trade agreements, various free trade agreements. So um, WHO has, has uh, in the assembly, has passed a number of extremely good resolutions saying that the Secretariat should be giving advice to countries. But um, when they do, the, uh, there's um, a very severe pushback by the, the donors, in particular the US. Um, another issue has been the proposal that uh, the funding of research and development for uh, uh, pharmaceuticals um, should be um, funded publicly so that the actual cost can be uh, much lower. And again, this has been supported in various ways by the member states in the uh, World Health Assembly but has been prevented from being enacted. And finally, there's been a huge amount of scaremongering, which is in direct uh, cooperation between the rich countries and Big Pharma itself, arguing that anything which is not uh, um, tightly controlled by intellectual property is probably counterfeit and probably dangerous. And this is complete rubbish, but uh, it has, and, but it is being used to encourage countries to adopt medicines legislation, which uh, in effect helps to police the extreme intellectual property claims of pharma. So let's just think about the implication of some of these um, battles uh, for COVID. First of all, it's likely that the um, that the uh, vaccine, when it comes, um, well, first of all, the fact that there's going to be a delay in getting access to the vaccine is a direct effect of the failure of research after the SARS crisis and the MERS crisis, both of which are also coronaviruses. And uh, were and there was initially, after those epidemics, there was some uh, move towards uh, uh, research, but that research dried up. Secondly, the restrictive intellectual property laws that operate will create barriers, and as Kajal has described. Um, thirdly, the extreme IP 
associated with trade liberalisation create further barriers to low and middle income countries actually establishing their own manufacturing capacity. Um, and those barriers will also lead to longer delays in procuring vaccines and medicines. And as Monica has said, I think the opposition to publicly funded the slogan of universal health coverage, which in the, in the, in the hands of the World Bank and WHO actually means opposition to publicly funded and publicly organised uh, health care, um, has again been um, a battle within WHO with the donor chokehold again playing an important role. So um, I guess the way in which WHO is controlled is quite critical to setting the conditions for e effective action to COVID. I want to, res want to make a, a brief comment on the early response to COVID-19. There was, in fact, a significant delay uh, from late December to early February in acknowledging person-to-person -person transmission in Wuhan. Um, this is regrettable. In my thinking, the Chinese public health officials were intimidated by their political leadership, who believed that somehow denying transmissibility would somehow make it go away. The, the delay which followed from this contributed to delays in implementing more targeted uh, travel restrictions, which, um, and as a consequence to the explosion of the epidemic and the need for harsher travel restrictions with deeper economic consequences. WHO's lack of scepticism regarding Chinese advice on transmissibility appears to have been a serious shortfall in their performance. Moving then to the um, broader issue of travel and trade restrictions generally, this has been fiercely debated um, in public health, between public health and trade officials since 1851 and before. The kind of concerns are, will travel, travel restrictions, are they sufficiently effective in disease control to justify the economic effects? Whether health protection um, is being used to justify protectionism and trade aggression, and whether the economic damage from travel and trade restrictions impacts on the resilience of affected countries in coping with the epidemic. The international health regulations uh, forbid restrictions on trade and travel unless approved by the emergency committee. But this has, um, this has not been uh, complied with in many cases. So in uh, the context of Ebola in 2014, many of the rich countries were uh, challenged by WHO for implementing travel and trade restrictions which were not justified, which were not approved by the emergency committee. Um, the implementation of severe travel restrictions in relation to COVID has had devastating impact. Um, the, the economic impact also in particular affects those countries which are least able to draw on their own resources to, uh, to confront COVID. And earlier sharing of evidence from Wuhan regarding transmissibility and perhaps the implementation of more targeted trade restrictions and travel restrictions could have avoided um, much of the, uh, possibly could have avoided some of the harm. Okay, so what is to be done? I think that I, I suggest four broad areas of work. Firstly, to continue to support the campaign against coronaviruses, including the provision of personal protective equipment, um, working towards getting, getting vaccines and medicines and diagnostics uh, out and being used. The second is to campaign for the kinds of IP reforms that Kajal and Mark were talking about. Um, in order to guarantee equitable access to medicines, to vaccines, to devices and diagnostics for the present and future pandemics. Thirdly is to support WHO against the hostilities of the US and its acolyte countries. 
And finally, to urge the member states, at least the remaining member states in the World Health Assembly, to lift the freeze on assessed contributions and to lift and untie their voluntary contributions so that the organisation is not facing uh, devastating um, uh, epidemics like this with one hand tied behind its back. So thanks, Monica. Thanks a lot, David, uh, also for keeping the time going. Um, so now we are entering to, uh, to the question and answers part of the, of the webinar. Um, we thank a lot for the participants for the questions you have registered. We may not be able um, to address all of them, but in all our webinars, uh, we've been registering all the questions and they will be very helpful for the future reflection and work that we'll be planning in the near future, so they won't be lost, promise. Uh, so our colleagues Gonzalo Verón and Reed Brennan have selected some of the questions, grouped them, made, made a synthesis of them. We'll be asking our panelists to please answer to them. Um, we'll go through, um, through the speakers in the same order. Uh, I'll ask uh, just you speakers to, uh, to please uh, briefly uh, like select one of the questions I'm going to read. You also, I also pasted them in, the, in, our, in our chat. Um, in three minutes or less, and you, that you also give us um, like your last thoughts uh, uh, because we are going a bit, uh, <laughs> we're running a little bit with time. So uh, during those three minutes, if you can also include your, your conclusion remarks, that would be fantastic. So I'm going to read the three like first questions. Um, first of all, how are big pharmas manipulating scientific, and scientific advances? and interfering in public scientific work. How is this linked to a vaccine for tackle the COVID-19 pandemic? First question. Second question. People's lives are at stake now. There's a particular concern about elder people and how the privatization of residences is influencing in the high level of old people deaths. So what, is, what are your comments on that? And third. What can we do as people's movements to revert the situation described by, by all the panelists? Uh, use of, uh, what is the use of COVID-19 to advocate for equal access? And how do we collect ideas, proposals, and experiences to change that? Um, so if that's fine for you, I will ask, first of all, uh, Susan to, to react on those questions and to share her, her thoughts. Susan, the floor is yours. You are muted, Susan, sorry for that. We, we can't hear you. Ah. Susan? Yes, now we it's can't hear me. Yeah, no, yes. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Can you repeat the first question? Sure. I, I didn't hear it, I'm sorry. Yes, no, no worries. So how are, how are big pharmas manipulating scientific advances and interfering in public scientific work? How is this linked to a vaccine for tackle the COVID-19 pandemic? You, Susan, you're also, and you and all the panelists are also uh, free to, to react on other, on the other panelists like uh, uh, interventions, etc. no? As you prefer. Um, I have not heard, and I mean, I think these presentations have been superb, and I'm not a person, uh, personally, I don't know that much about all of these different connections in the field of health. However, I think that it is important to know about legislation, and I hear again, I cite the United States, which has been active in changing or renewing or uh, otherwise uh, putting into the books legislation in 1600 different areas. That's the whole health lobby that has been constantly in the Congress, in the Senate, and constantly working on the government. And that's what you can do when you have uh, a, a trillion, uh, 800 billion uh, dollars. You can be on top of legislation at all times. And I think if we don't think about what the politics are and what is happening from year to year, here again, I'm, on, I'm talking about the rich countries and France, which is my, my own country, but the, the, the French system 
used to be absolutely fantastic. And the World Health Organization said we were number one in the world. And I can verify that through my own personal experience. My husband died 18 years ago and he received fantastic care of all kinds, operation, intensive care, et cetera, and was able to come home for the last two weeks of his life and be with his whole family. We were all around him when he died. Now, 18 years later, there has been a lot of digging under, uh, undermining the, the, the health system. Uh, the neoliberals have been chipping away at the various good things about this system. And that's why we weren't prepared for the, uh, for the COVID-19, uh, because it was, a, it was a just in time system. And I think it was possible to have everyone cared for. I've seen it. Everyone cared for. People in the hospitals are now making so little money and they are so ill-equipped that you have to be totally devoted. You have to be practically a saint to keep on working in a hospital and not in a private clinic where you would have to pay something. We can afford this. I'm not saying that every, every country in Africa could afford this, but little by little, if you tax properly, if you have a social security system worth the name, this can be done, but it can only be done through law. It can only be done if you are on top of the, the, those who, who make those laws and they have to be troubled all the time. They have to be bothered. They have to be, you know, um, losing my words, but they have to be pushed at every turn to make the laws the ones that will serve the people. Now, what I see happening is that the people who are getting sick are the ones who live in the poor neighborhoods in, in France. Uh, they are the ones who are confined because there are seven or eight of them to two rooms, something like that. And of course they come down with, uh, it's, it's a class system also. We mustn't forget that, that the poor people, even in a rich country, are going to be the first victims. So I, 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 okay. Thanks, sorry, sorry. No, no, but sorry that's fine. Thanks, Helen. Um, so we'll give the floor to, to Baba. And please just, I think you have a, all of you will have like the maximum, maximum three minutes. Otherwise, I will be obligated to cut you. Sorry for that. Oh, wait, thank you. Um, I, I partly responded to the first question earlier, give examples of uh, lobby by pharma, give example of free seniors. Uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, speaking finally, I think it is important to address each and every aspect of what we are addressing. But even more importantly is to fight for systemic change. This crisis has shown the interconnectedness of public health, the social economic system and so on and so forth. We need a new radical economy. We need a paradigm shift. We need to learn from why was it that in 2008, when we had the greatest crisis after the Great Depression, or like the Great Repression, Depression, that government responded, you know, with the New Deal, they made pushed through in 2008 and thereafter, more of what got us into the ailment society was thrown into as the medicine out. And the difference is this, in the 1930s, with the hunger matches, with the sitting in the factories, people demanded for much more than just piecemeal changes. We need to demand for fundamental structural and systemic change, a new global consensus that covers the issues of health, that, and which essentially puts people over profit. That is the only way we are even sustainable development goals. Uh, over 110 countries have the right to health engraved in their constitution, but formalistic and little demands at this time cannot be it. We need to go beyond the bread to talk about the bakery. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, Baba, for this. I will give the word to, to Mark Haywood, please. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a, one proposal to make as I sum up, which is that we have to organize. The question was, uh, what can we do as people's movements? Up to this point, people's movements have not been visible enough in the response to COVID-19. We haven't been uh, heard enough in explaining why this COVID-19 crisis has come about. Uh, I talked about the way we were able to operate truly globally around HIV. We need to operate truly globally around COVID-19, but see COVID-19 not narrowly, but see it politically for what it is. It is about the capture of health by corporations. It is about the neutering of institutions like the World Health Organization. It is about the lack and neglect of sanitation. It is about the climate crisis and will become about the climate crisis. It is about women's rights. It is about all of those issues. And it is a call to us to work together. Now, sometimes it takes a crisis to get us to work together. This crisis has made many, many people, not just leftists and socialists, point a finger at capital, at capitalism, at elites, at the 1% and say, you brought us to this doorstep. So we have to help them to bring about the change. We have to see COVID-19, not just as the emergency of the next two or three months, but as an emergency that will carry over into a social reconstruction. So I would ask TNI to think about organizing a webinar like this to talk about organizing, to talk about what are our networks, what are our, our capabilities, what are the issues that we need to, to draw on if we are going to have more than a very useful uh, uh, exchange on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. I think all TNIers here have heard you. Also important to know that in the chat, you are having very important exchanges. There are a lot of movements of people as participants. So uh, yeah, there are also I think ideas to mobilize in the chat, but of course we will hear to what, what you proposed. So I will give the word now to Kajal. Kajal, please go ahead. So, um, so I actually, uh, I mean, since we're running desperately short of time, I'm just going to end with um, uh, a little bit of uh, alluding to what Baba and Mark have already said, but also to pay tribute to Martin Kaur, uh, you know, who we lost at the beginning of April to a long battle uh, with cancer, who was for many of us a leading light on understanding the inequities in the international trading system. And a few years ago, writing about the Ebola and the Zika outbreaks, he said that the outbreaks showed how global health emergencies can quickly develop and that the world was not prepared to cope. And most importantly, he said, these are man-made disasters created by policies that place economic interests above health and environmental concerns. So I really echo what Baba and Mark said and, and also in, in tribute to what Martin wrote that, that if we do not deal with the inequities in the international system, uh, we are gonna find ourselves in the same place over and over again. Uh, you know, when I was preparing for this to think that 20 years ago, these were the arguments that were being made. And now in the face of this pandemic, we are still having to justify and explain uh, why these rules do not work uh, is, is a sobering moment. Uh, you know, this is not an I told you so that any of us are happy to, to say. Um, so, so I would just sort of end with that, that I just really want to echo uh, Martin's words as well as, um, um, you know, uh, Marks and, and Baba's that we really need to look at how to, to work with the system uh, systemically. Uh, I think that's, I'll probably end with that. Thanks a lot, Kashel. Um, so David, it's over to you. I think the um, other speakers have uh, said what needs to be said, that we need broad system change and we need to talk more about how we could encourage a convergence of social movements around the world to drive both progress in respect of COVID and WHO and broader system change. I just want to make two points. One is cultural, that um, what we can do to promote um, a sense of solidarity in the context of COVID as, 
uh, instead of the kind of fearful uh, individualism um, and insecurity which uh, is in many countries driving a new form of fascism, um, that's quite an important thing to do. But secondly, to challenge the focus entirely on the corporate control and to reframe it in terms of um, the transnational capitalist class, which includes the corporate and political leaders of the rich countries, particularly the imperialist countries, um, and to, um, to think about the neoliberal um, project as the attempt by the corporate transnational capitalist class to, to protect its elites from the consequences of the climate crisis and the crises of capitalism itself. The, the problems of overproduction and financialization and the growing imbalances and the shocking um, inequalities. Um, so neoliberalism as a strategy to defend the, uh, the, the international capitalist class against its own instabilities has to be something which can help us to build that convergence um, and also to take forward the, um, the, uh, the sort of cultural challenges such as addressing people's insecurity progressively across time. Thanks a lot, David. Um, so we are about to finish our webinar. Um, before reminding some key points we brought from all our panelists, I would like to share that some work on regaining the, uh, yeah, the power of cooperation, which T and I, together with several of the co-sponsoring organizations and movements of this webinar are doing, is the global campaign to end corporate impunity and corporate capture. And one important element of this campaign is precisely the mobilization uh, around the UN binding treaty at the Human Rights Council uh, in order to, to make, uh, well, to, to build uh, uh, binding regulations for transnational corporations in order to respect human rights. And that, of course, includes the human right to health. So that's a space where we are mobilizing around that. So I would like to. To, to remind some key points that you brought here. Susan, for example, like the other speakers emphasize, you have flagged up the, uh, that the health corporations and the, the, their powerful lobbyists have put right to health up for sale, our right to health, and it has been integrated into the neoliberal market for profit. Insist, and you have insisted on the corporate demand for privatization, deregulation, and exemption from taxes. But you also reminded us that that's very important that our resistance to these powerful corporate players is supported by a growing public opinion and a growing majority of people around the world demanding a public health system for all everywhere. You know? We see our movements are, are fighting back now, as Baba said, you know, of the trade unions. And as Mark has concrete, uh, I mean, Mark brought really concrete proposals for mobilizing, he reminded us that we, we need to learn from the lessons of the previous pandemics, and we really need to strengthen uh, the, the work uh, on the ground, building a, a broader convergence that was also brought by the other panelists. You know? And David, thanks a lot for giving those key elements of the strategies to con counter corporate capture of the global governance of health. You know? Finally, Kajal, you, you, you brought, I think, I think you're the line that COVID-19 is also a new opportunity demanding uh, new levels of international solidarity and optimism. And that we, we need to find a way to not only take health back from corporations, but to take the world back from corporations, no? So we look forward to continuing with you on this challenging and uh, very necessary journey, no? To a future beyond corporate capture. Um, we are about to finish, so thanks. I would like to thank a lot to, to all the panelists and to the participants. Um, you are going to find in the chat um, the website of, of the co-sponsors of this uh, webinar, and we strongly suggest you to visit those websites because they really cover a wide spectrum of the issues that were treated today. Also, a big thanks to the, to the interpreters and uh, to the whole TNI and um, team for the great uh, organizational support, in particular to Jess. Uh, next week's uh, webinar uh, is going to be the 29th of April. 
and it, it will focus on authoritarian responses to the crisis. So you can register via our website now and uh, either Nick or Sol should be putting the, in the chat the link to register for the next uh, TNI webinar. We will continue with the weekly webinars after. So we invite you to contact us uh, for, yeah, with other ideas for future webinars, perhaps as just uh, as Mark has done, you know? And to make sure you don't miss future events, you can register also for the TNI newsletter. And uh, if you found today's session useful, please also consider donating via our website to help us to cover some of the costs associated to organizing this series. Um, and yeah, thank you once again for joining us. And uh, we leave the chat open during st uh, still 10 minutes in order you can wrap up the conversations there. So thanks again and uh, take care. Adios.